Hello, my name is Dave Emery, once again. And uh, rather than conclude the series with uh, the chilling description of the actual execution of Ron Goldman and uh, Nicole, I thought I'd also uh, fill in some material, the, the rest of the blow-by-blow account, so to speak, of this particular crime, and uh, the informant's description of how exactly the physical evidence was planted in order to frame O.J. Simpson. Once again, the book Blood Oath by Stephen Worth, W-O-R-T-H, and Carl Jaspers, C-A-R-L-J-A-S-P-E-R-S, subtitled The Conspiracy to Murder Nicole Brown Simpson, published in softcover by Rainbow Books, copyright 1996. And uh, this book is distributed by the Lee Salters Company. The 800 number that people can call in order to order the book is 800 800- Three five six nine three one five. That's eight hundred three five six nine three one five. We're going to turn again to the actual minute, more or less minute by minute account of the executions and the planting of the evidence. So I think, in terms of for uh, historical slash curiosity value, the actual story of how. Uh, the physical evidence was planted, at least according to this informant, codenamed Skinner, uh, might be worth uh, including in the narrative. Also, I'm going to uh, sum up uh, briefly what we've looked at in this series and uh, give a few thoughts about uh, the book as a whole, uh, assuming we have time. Returning once again to the chapter that presents uh, Skinner's account, uh, it's chapter 15, of how the executions and planning of evidence took place. 2246 hours, Blade, and by the way, each of the team members of this elite uh, Nazi strike team is known by a code name. 2246 hours, Blade radioed that the task was complete and briefly explained his outburst, quote, We're wrapping it up now so you can relax, but better start the banging now without the glove. We'll plan it later. Copy, Blade requested, uh, interrupting the banging as the banging on Cato's on the wall of the guest house to alert Cato. 2246 hours. Quote, the limo driver just called his mother. Can you believe it? He wants his mama. What a wuss. 2247 hours. Grip responded. Copy, will do. 2248 hours. Grip took the pool stick with a plastic bag and cotton wrapped around the broad end of it and performed the cueing, as it was later jokingly called. This concerns the planting uh, of a bloody glove, which was taken from the murder scene uh, to O.J.'s place and uh, it stuck to a chain-link fence. 22.48 hours. Blade checked Nicole and then Goldman. Thumper undid the intercom bug and recovered the recorder. Blade took off O.J.'s knit cap and dropped it and his left glove just to his left under the overhang of a small shrub. 22.49 hours. Blade deliberately walked through the puddle of blood surrounding Nicole, ensuring that the soles of the Bruno Maglies were sufficiently wet to leave a trail. Then he walked up the left side of the walkway toward the back gate. Using the syringe of O.J.'s blood he took from his fanny pack, like a craftsman gluing parts together, he squeezed out a series of blood drops next to the footprints. He placed the drops at strategic positions along the way. Then, he carefully walked back towards the front, taking care not to step on the fresh prints by staying to his left. Every now and then, he stopped to survey his work. When he reached the bodies, he let a couple of more drops fall from the syringe. Drippings off the knife provided additional spots. In the alley, blade and Speedy unsnapped their jumpsuits and placed them along with Blade's shoes, what was left of Speedy's shoe coverings, socks, gloves, and knives in a plastic garbage bag. Blade kept his OJ mask on. By the way, uh, interjecting, uh, of course, the conspirators had, according to this account, uh, acquired a sample of OJ's blood from uh, uh, one of their Nazi slash white supremacist cohorts, who was a blood and DA was described as a blood and DNA specialist at Cedars-Sinai Hospital when O.J. was having some surgery there. Uh, That uh, individual was codenamed Colby. It might be Stephen Garrett Colburn, an acquaintance of Timothy McVeigh's, and uh, an apparent white supremacist uh, who 
may have been one of the weapons suppliers for the AME church operation. But again, that is conjectural. 2249, that's one of the, the elements of conjecture that the authors engage in. 2249 hours. Driver just made another call. No answer. 2250 hours. Blade and Speedy, dressed in their cooler, dark, short sleeve shirts and jeans, pulled out in the O.J. look-alike Bronco, leaving Thumper and the Enforcer to gather up the folding ladder plus any other remaining marks of their visit, thus putting the finishing touches on the frame of the century, unquote. Curious about the identity of Nicole's visitor, the Enforcer entered the condo. After a quick walkthrough, he noticed a cup of ice cream he had watched Nicole buy at Ben and Jerry's sitting on the back downstairs banister. He had always wanted to try that chocolate ice cream with the chunks. However, this cup could only remind him of the visitor. Shame you couldn't stay around and enjoy the dessert, he remarked to the cup. Outside, Murphy's Law provided an incident that almost destroyed our carefully orchestrated plan. 2251 hours. Blade left Bundy with his lights off and almost ran into a gray Nissan. He yelled obscenities at the driver. Effing Jap cars, unquote, while he attempted to cross San Vicente after running a red light. That cardinal sin, which had been discussed many times, was almost the downfall of the plan. Speedy spotted the confrontation coming and ducked down out of sight. Looking back on it, whoever the other drivers were, all they saw was O.J. Simpson in a white Ford Bronco with his license plate heading towards Rockingham. By the way, that was a woman named Jill Shively. And uh, when the timeline of her running into O.J. did not uh, jibe with the official already decided upon version of what had happened, uh, she chose to uh, disregard that. I believe Jill Shively also had uh, sold her story to the uh, National Enquirer as well, and so would not have been eligible as a witness. Continuing, 2252 hours. Now the driver's answering the car phone, getting some instruction from someone. Must be his boss, unquote. 2253 hours. Now, uh, O.J.'s telephones were turned back on. Recall that this team had not only bugged O.J.'s and Nicole's phones, but had disabled O.J.'s phone so he couldn't either receive or place any phone calls to give him an alibi. Uh, they had also put bugs in both uh, O.J.'s and Nicole's place and had the places under physical surveillance. Again, the, many of these people were veteran covert ops veterans, uh, ex-Green Beret, law enforcement, and other uh, others with, uh, quote, specialized knowledge and abilities, unquote, as my eight-part series uh, put it. And they had the most sophisticated uh, surveillance and uh, intelligence uh, equipment available. This basically was a covert operation, albeit one at least ostensibly pulled out, at least at the operational level, by this uh, white supremacist group, this Nazi group. It would not surprise me, again, that it, uh, if uh, their command structure could be followed all the way up, something they, of course, could not do. They were in a blind cell that one might very well find elements within our own government uh, that uh, were in cahoots with these uh, th this team. Again, the government, there's no such thing as the government. There are all sorts of disparate elements of the government, uh, many of which don't get along with or actually oppose the actions of uh, other elements. Uh, so it's important, I think, not to conceive of the government as a single entity. There are many, many, many different elements in it, many of them opposed to each other. Continuing, 2254 hours. Grip spotted O.J. coming out of the house with some bags, followed by his dog. He dropped the bags outside, walked around a little, and suddenly, seemingly mindful of the time, rushed back in. The limo driver may have spotted him. 2255 hours. The limo driver tried the intercom again. He heard, we heard, and recorded O.J. answering. 2256 hours. Grip reported Cato opened the gate from inside by pushing a remote electric switch. 2257 hours. Blade parked their Bronco on Bristol and waited for O.J. and the limo to leave for the airport. 2300 hours. Grip observed O.J. coming to, coming outside to greet the limo driver. The light overhead reflected off O.J.'s hair, which appeared wet as if he had just showered and it had not been dried. 2305 hours. It appeared that our banging piqued O.J.'s and Cato's interest. Thanks to the listening devices we planted in the fortress, we heard them discussing the noise behind Cato's room and where to look for a flashlight. 2315 hours. 
O.J. and the limo finally departed for the airport, turning left past and around the Bronco. 2316 hours. By now, the enforcer had cleaned up the planted bugs and remotes inside the condo. Thumper had climbed the pole in the back alley and removed the tap. They had one more task, yet they had to wait another half hour to perform it until they were sure O.J. would make his flight. I remember the newspaper article which said he's always running late. 2345 hours. Grip spotted Cato leaving his room. He's walking up towards the front door. What's he doing now? Cato just went inside. I wonder, unquote. Grip interrupted his rambling statement. Again, quoting, He's coming back out and heading back toward his room, unquote. 2346 hours. While the enforcer kept a watchful eye on the surrounding area, now awake due to Nicole's howling dog, Thumper approached 874 Bundy across the street. He created a minor disturbance at the house. From our previous surveillance, we knew an elderly woman lived there and any noise would result in a call to the local police department. The murders had to be discovered early so our Trojan horse could perform. Uh, that is uh, some of their Nazi and white supremacist uh, cohorts inside of uh, L.A. law enforcement. But uh, since this was a blind cell, they did not know the actual identities of who uh, they were. Continuing. On his way back across the street, Thumper's final act was to further open Nicole's front gate so the bodies could be seen when the police arrived. 2359 hours. Blade removed the interior light bulb of O.J.'s Bronco. He and Speedy wiped blood from their gloves around the interior. They paid particular attention to the center console, then tried to leave a bloody footprint on the carpet. Being only partially successful, the gloves were placed black back in the plastic bag of bloody clothes, and O.J.'s plates were reattached. The Bronco was then moved back to its original position, just north of the 360 curb marking. To enter the fortress, by the way, again, uh, the term fortress here is a nickname they had applied to O.J.'s residence. To enter the fortress, they scaled the wall by using the limb of a tree protruding over the wall near the Ashford Gate. They walked to the Rockingham driveway. As they walked up the drive toward the house, they squeezed a few drops of O.J.'s blood out of the syringe to continue the trail of blood that previously had ended in the alley behind Nicole's condo. 2,400 hours. Grip and I headed into the fortress using the Ashford Gate entrance. We had watched Cato open this gate several times without any key and knew the routine. O.J.'s dog ran toward us and started to make strange dog noises. I hit him with a dart containing a low-level tranquilizer, similar to the type used to transport animals aboard aircraft. Grip, who was carrying the bag of bloody clothes he had removed from our Bronco, tripped on a shrub and blurted out, quote, Son of a bitch, unquote. The dog became very quiet. Uh, zero, 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 one hours. Lucky Monday, June, th- June 13th. Grip and I went, went through the places, Grip and I went through the paces of removing all traces of our presence from the outside, including bugs and remote devices. We used the security code previously obtained to enter the house and remove all embedded bugs. We were also going to plant in O.J.'s bedroom the bloody socks Blade had worn. Unfortunately, they had sunk into a pool of blood that had collected in the bottom of the plastic garbage bag used to transport them from the scene. They were soaked. Too bloody. We thought they would raise the suspicions of investigators to make such a a find of one pair of extremely bloody socks in a pristine bedroom otherwise devoid of such evidence. So we stuffed them back in the bag. Meanwhile, Blade and Speedy retrieved the remaining glove Blade had worn at Bundy from the plastic bag of bloody clothes and took it to the area behind Cato's room and dropped it there. Uh, zero, 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 nine hours. We overheard a call to the police about a burglary at 874 Bundy. We knew they'd look around and find the bodies. Zero, zero, one, two hours. All three vehicles were on the road following their pre-programmed routes out of Los Angeles. I couldn't help but smile as I conjured up the look that this one rich nigger would have on his face when they arrested his sorry A blank blank and piled the evidence we planted on top of him. I'd give anything to get inside of his brain to watch the activity as he tries to generate an alibi. It's going to be extremely interesting when he testifies. Excuse me, I believe the pool cue was actually used to uh, 
Uh, it, it, they're, I'm a little confused from reading the account. Uh, the pool cue may very well have been used to somehow plant the glove at the actual murder scene, or else uh, there's an editorial mistake here in the account. But in any event, there's discussion of a plan to use a pool cue to uh, plant uh, the glove. However, the description here was of uh, uh, dropping it behind Cato's. Perhaps there was a... Uh, a change in uh, the scenario, or perhaps the pool cue was simply used to uh, uh, transport uh, a glove uh, from uh, the murder scene into the bag so that it basically, uh, well, it, it, it's unclear to me. There's either an editorial mistake or there was a, plain, a change in plans uh, that is not accounted for in this particular account. Continuing. Meanwhile, Blade... And Speedy retrieved the remaining glove Blade had worn at Bundy from the plastic black bag of bloody clothes and took it to the area behind Cato's room and dropped it there. Maybe that maybe they're simply referring to dropping it there with the pool cue. Anyway, it's unclear here. Zero 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 nine hours. We overheard a call to the police about a burglary at eight seventy four Bundy. We knew they'd look around and find the bodies. Zero zero one two hours. All three vehicles were on the road following their pre-programmed routes out of Los Angeles. I couldn't help but smile as I conjured up the look that this one rich nigger would have on his face when they arrested his sorry A-blank-blank and piled the evidence we planted on top of him. I'd give anything to get inside of his brain and watch the activity as he tried to generate an alibi. It's going to be extremely interesting when he testifies. And by the way, again, uh, forgive my use of strong language. I'm reporting, I'm reading the... Uh, dialogue and text here as it is presented in order to uh, maintain the, the uh, veracity or the verisimilitude of what is written here. Continuing. 0013 hours. The police arrive at 874 and 875 Bundy Drive. Undoubtedly, this was a record response time for the LAPD, or that Sunday night must have been one hell of a slow night of crime. In either case, the rush to justice that we predicted had begun. Driven by a political need to quench the fires of criticism that engulfed the inept Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office headed by Gil Garcetti, a must-convict mentality reigned. The morning of June 13, 1994, began with a rapid call-up of a grand multitude of investigative and prosecutorial forces. The world would shortly witness one of the, most, one of the greatest marshallings of legal power ever assembled for the sole purpose of provi- proving that O.J. Simpson committed the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Lyle Goldman. A plan conceived by the deliverer, the leader of a group many agencies warned was, quote, armed and dangerous, unquote, had accomplished a feat that would be etched in history, that would be etched in history forever. The frame was now a reality. And that is uh, the informant's account of how the information, uh, how the evidence was planted. Again, uh, just exactly how the pool cue fits in here uh, remains uh, something of a question uh, in my mind. Uh, I'm going to briefly sum up what we've looked at in this particular series. Uh, we began by taking a look at uh, some of the previous... Well, first of all, we began by taking a look at the circumstances under which this anonymous informant, codenamed Skinner, who uh, maintains he was a member of this strike team, contacted the authors. Uh, recall that uh, he had not only been feeling guilty about uh, some of the carnage after Oklahoma City, but also some of his Vietnam uh, War nightmares, some of the uh, ferocious nightmares that he'd been having, had begun to return after Oklahoma City and the murders of Ron Nicole. And he began having these nightmares where he would wake up just bathed in sweat. And a uh, combination of that and uh, apparently some guilt over Oklahoma City and uh, also apparently losing some of his comrades at Oklahoma City led him to decide to uh, communicate this information. We then looked at a couple of uh, past operations, one successful and one abortive, uh, from this same group. One of the uh, successful operation was the murder of music promoter and nightclub owner Brett Cantor. Uh, O.J.'s defense team, by the way, in the uh, trial pointed out the similarity in the way that Brett Cantor had been murdered. Uh, this white supremacist team, this Nazi team, had approached Brett Cantor about uh, promoting a white supremacist band called Rahoa, R-A-H-O-W-A, or Racial Holy War. He refused to do that and apparently had some unkind remarks about the group. That cost him his life, and they cut his throat 
uh, in an almost identical fashion to the way Ron's and Nicole's throats were cut. This group was unable to pull off uh, a bombing and slaughter of the parishioners at the uh, AME, the African uh, uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, I believe it was. Anyway, the AME Church in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, it may be that uh, one of their associates, uh, they, they boast of one of their associates having been the weapon supplier for that operation. Then we took a look at the planning for what was a PSYOP, basically. We're going to touch on this at the end of this broadcast. Uh, a psychological operation intended to divide blacks and whites uh, in order to, if not a foment, foment a race war, to uh, promote the eventual rise to power of uh, the, this Nazi-slash-white supremacist group. We took a look at uh, the fact that this PSYOP was directed at the legal system and also at law enforcement in general and the LAPD in particular. We took a look at the foreign backers of this uh, particular operation. Uh, they were backed by a, what is described as a foreign terrorist group with unlimited funds. The text suggests the distinct possibility that this may have been a German Nazi group of some kind, but that, that also uh, is not absolutely established. We also took a look at uh, the fact that uh, this strike team was composed of... Uh, members of blind cells, and that indeed only the ex-former high-ranking military officer known as the Deliverer knew who the, quote, generals, unquote, in the operation were. He also was the uh, go-between between this uh, blind cell and the unnamed foreign terrorist group. We took a look at uh, the successful recruiting by Dennis Mahone, uh, one of the individuals being uh, pursued by, St by Timothy McVeigh's attorney, Stephen Jones, uh, Dennis Mahone recruited uh, white supremacists, uh, recruited LAPD and LA Sheriff's Office members uh, into this, uh, into his white supremacist group, the White Knights of the Imperial Clan. According to the informant, uh, the, his efforts were much more successful than the authorities realized, and apparently some of those recruits participated as the, quote, Trojan horse, unquote, including the uh, cops stationed at the uh, station house that would be called to respond to the murders. Uh, that cop or cops, it's unclear whether it's more than one, uh, referred to by the code name the Dark German. We took a look at uh, information that indicated that the, some of these cops had delivered a warning to O.J. that his life was in danger. These cops uh, were not only supplying field-level intelligence about O.J.'s domestic difficulties to the strike team, but they also were intended to lead the investigation in the direction of O.J. Simpson. We also looked at information indicating that, in fact, O.J. Simpson, according to uh, accounts in a Mark Elliott book about Cato Kalin, had been receiving threats from a white supremacist group and that the warnings had been delivered by detectives in LAPD. We looked at the extensive military uh, covert operations and law enforcement backgrounds of the team that accomplished this particular hit, according to Skinner. We took a look at the extremely sophisticated surveillance and uh, monitoring equipment, uh, surveillance and intelligence equipment, that this group had uh, night vision devices. They bugged the phones. They bugged the residences. Or they tapped the phones. They bugged the residences. Uh, the group also, that is to say the strike team cause, had uh, assistance from uh, forensics people who told them what they would need in terms of evidence to frame O.J. Simpson. They also, according to the account presented here, had someone who was involved with blood and uh, DNA at Cedars-Sinai Hospital. When O.J. was having surgery there, that may very well have been Stephen Garrett Colburn. Of that, the authors speculate that that may have been Stephen Garrett Colburn, an acquaintance of McVeigh's who was up on a weapons charge and was wanted uh, for uh, basically, a there was a warrant out for his arrest. He was a, a blood and DNA specialist at Cedars-Sinai Hospital in exactly this time period. We also took a look at the fact uh, that... According to Skinner, uh, the team entered O.J.'s residence and took out clothes uh, and shoes and other possessions of O.J.'s to plant at the scene that they were also following and bugging Paula Barbieri's place, Paula Barbieri, O.J. Simpson's girlfriend at the time. We took a look at uh, some uh, tangential connections between uh, some of the information presented and uh, Oklahoma City. Again, uh, the informant stated that the Oklahoma City operation was performed by this same group, and uh, in fact that it was his disgust over Oklahoma City that led him, uh, in part, to uh, come forward with this information. Uh, we took a look at Mark Furman's retiring to Sandpoint, Idaho, uh, just as Lewis Beam, the author of Leaderless Resistance, an Aryan Nations member and member of the Order uh, that had killed Alan Berg, and the 10th anniversary of that killing was to be celebrated with this particular operation, Operation Thunderbolt. 
We also took a look at uh, possible connections between this cause group and the derailing of the Sunset Limited, uh, an Amtrak train that went down on the second anniversary, October 9th, 1995, of the founding of this group. And uh, we also took a look at uh, Bob Fletcher, a former member of the militia of Montana, and his statement that Mark Furman would make uh, a wonderful recruit for the militias. Finally, we concluded by examining the description, according to Skinner, of the actual execution of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson and the planting of evidence against uh, O.J. Simpson. Uh, again, it, uh, I cannot state that there is not disinformation in this book. There may be. I suspect that there was more to this particular operation than we have been seeing. I hold open the possibility that uh, a Nazi faction within our government itself and within the national security establishment may have been involved with this. I also suspect that... Uh, that uh, corresponding white supremacist and Nazi-oriented elements within the media were part of this same operation. That, however, is pure conjecture on my part. Note again that uh, in addition to, fo to exacerbating race relations in this country or hostility between the races, the targets of this operation were the legal system I itself and also law enforcement in general and the LAPD in particular. I'm going to reread uh, the description, uh, according to Skinner, of how this operation was planned for. Again, according to the description placed here, uh, or presented here, this was a Nazi PSYOP, a psychological operation, to occur and to observe the 10th anniversary of Allen Berg's assassination. The plan for the anniversary celebration consisted of a plot so sinister, so creative, so diabolical that the outcome would provide for the embarrassment of an entire city, an entire race, and an entire nation. The plot included a well-thought-out action that would damage the U.S. judicial system forever. It would create a sense of doubt that would exist in every future trial. When we had all gathered in the farmhouse's spacious parlor, the discoverer continued to explain the rationale of the plan. Quote, Evidence presented and testimony offered by law enforcement officers will be challenged forever from this case forward, unquote, he said. Still quoting, it's a plan designed in part to be a payback for all those responsible for actions that have been carried out against freedom-loving white supremacists, unquote. Another founder of the cause picked up the explanation. By the way, we also took a look at uh, a legal foundation for uh, white supremacists called Cause, headed up by Kirk Lyons. Continuing, the plan, quote, the plan is centered around an individual easily recognized and respected among both blacks and whites. It will look like he's being framed by the authorities. The situation is designed to call upon and challenge interpersonal beliefs that every person holds. People will choose sides. Their consciences won't permit otherwise. The final coup will occur when our target is found guilty or his credibility is destroyed. This event will generate instant racial tension followed by violence. We're going to ensure that by fueling what will already be an inflamed situation. The plan will use the distrust between the authorities and the blacks that exi that's existed in Los Angeles for years. At first, everyone will choose up sides. As the discussions become heated and clouded with rhetoric, violence will follow. After much destruction has occurred, the cause will then step forward to take credit for this framing. But it will be painfully obvious that we couldn't have done it without the help of an easily duped, overzealous prosecution." Unquote. Among the questions I have, and that concerns the possibility that perhaps this informant was coming forward in order to perhaps give, uh, take credit for this operation on behalf of cause. Again, I'm not saying that is the case. However, uh, I don't think that's an unreasonable question to ask under the circumstances. Perhaps uh, the motives for this informant were more complex than uh, we have been told. In any event, that concludes this particular segment. My name's Dave Emery. Thanks for listening.